Hi, I'm Tim. Welcome to Watchbox and thanks for logging on. This is Watches Tonight. I'm your host, Sean's on the switcher this evening, and we have a live studio audience, which I always appreciate. This evening, we chat live. We discuss my top 10 chronographs to buy in 2023, and I share your viewer wrist shots tonight here on Watches Tonight. By the way, guys, do you want an all-in-one valuation hub news source? curated stream of novelties, opinion, and news coverage. You can have all of that and more with the Watchbox app. That's right, it is newly redesigned. You can tailor your stream of journals and blogs and industry events. Plus, you can store your collection and see the newest releases from Watchbox, plus my own videos as they post in real time. Check us out, we're on the Apple App Store and Google Play, that is the Watchbox app. We've got our live audience streaming in. I've got Soma R from Budapest, Pest, Edward Ledden of Sweden, Matt Foster, Desilus II, Arto Scharl from New York City, Joe Pinto from the American Heartland in Louisville. We got Watches with Dennis from Kansas and Geezer staying up late with us in London. Many more to follow. Remember to join me, Tim underscore Masso, on Instagram. It is the official after party for Watches tonight. All right, viewer wrist shots number one. I asked, you answered your wrist on my list. Mufadal G is strapped for summer with his Vashron Overseas Chrono. Note the lovely seasonal white rubber strap, looking good. Carl B scored a rare steel Patek Philippe Nautilus 5711-1300A. Note the combination of steel and diamonds. That was a sizzling one-year-only edition. We've got Paolo M, who was recently in our studio for a collector conversation. Tune in for that. He's a lucky man wearing his Alangu Unzona Saxonia on the day of his wedding. Long may you prosper. We've got Luis who stuns with his Patek Philippe Aquanaut chronograph on the coast at what I'm guessing is a sunset. And then we have Tom B, who's lucky enough to score a Mad One Red for a drive with his BMW M850. And we've got David N, who reveals a rare Zenith Grand Class El Primero Limited Edition chronograph. Send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com to see your watch on this box. We've got friends joining in, Simon Holt. We've got Abraham Stein from Michigan, Jim Millet, Ray's Way from Toronto. Toronto in the Great White North. And we've got Jeff G saying he would love to send me a wrist check from Alaska. That's Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com, Jeff. All right, our regularly scheduled program, top 10 chronographs to buy in 2023. Now, here's the thing, guys. I'm going to try to avoid repeating watches you've seen on the show before. So if you're wondering why I'm not talking about the Long Untaina Albert, it's because I've said enough. All right. Let's start with a genre. Do you love motorsports and cars? Well, here's the inside line for car lovers and racing enthusiasts. We're gonna start with a watch that everyone's talking about this year, the obvious choice to open the picture. This is the Rolex Daytona. 60 years old this year, funny fact, it was originally the Rolex Le Mans, but they probably realized that Americans don't do French articles or silent ends. And this watch is basically all new, but the same size, 40 millimeters in platinum. It's still slim, trim, and easy to fit underneath the cuff. Somewhere between a sports watch and a dress watch by Rolex standards. What's really new isn't on the front of the watch. There you'll find the familiar combination of the chocolate brown ceramic, the ice blue dial, and the lovely sheen of platinum, bright white as it always is. It's still 72 hour power reserve, column wheel, vertical clutch, 100 meters, and a chronometer. So what is new with this reference 126506? Well, it's the case back now with the Daytona first display case back and a few things have changed. The old caliber 4130 becomes the caliber 4131. What are the changes? Well, the big ones are aesthetic. As you can see, we've got a new rotor in gold that's been skeletonized to show you more of the works. The pivot jewels in the bridges are now gold chaton style for a little bit of a vintage nod. And what were previously satinated bridges now feature Cote de Genève stripes. Fundamentally, it is the same watch. The biggest material change is the use of Paraflex shock protection. This is a movement designed to be seen, hence the visual changes. Now, the diamond dial is back for 23. So if you want to spend more money on your platinum Rolex, you do have the ability to get the diamond indices on the dial. And I still think that is the most poetic use of diamonds on a men's watch in 2023. Although to be fair, lady drivers and race enthusiasts can also fit this one because it's not too big. Other updates include the gold Oyster Flex models. They now get the sliding glide lock adjustment, which is wonderful. We should have had that years ago, but better late than never. 
Sticking to the Platinum, this one's going to retail for around $75,000. Count on a little bit more once these get to market, plus more, of course, if you want the diamond dial. Now, availability will be limited, but Richard Combs, our friend in South Florida, has sung the praises of this one. He sent in many wrist shots, and he and I would assure you it's worth the wait. All right, we've got Joshua M. Cheers from Auckland, New Zealand, getting up super early on the other side of the world, and we appreciate that. We have Matt S. saying, I hope he includes the IWC Lake Tahoe. That's right, the Pilot's Watch Lake Tahoe, a lovely ceramic edition in white. It's not in the program, but I'm glad you mentioned it. I love it. I love IWC Pilot's Watches. I just thought maybe that's a bit too predictable. Although, I will admit, not all of my pilot watches in this show are the most unconventional. But the Lake Tahoe is a beautiful thing if you have the panache to pull off a full white watch. If you're Italian, you're good to go. Everyone else, try before you buy. Okay, jumping back in, we got McLauder from the Netherlands. We've got Hans N joining in. And we've got Curtis A, our friend from San Diego. Helicopter pilot watch collector extraordinaire. Check out his collector conversation feature that we did. It was one of our all-time greatest hits with 60,000 views and counting. He says, it's a gloomy day in San Diego. Many thanks to Tim and crew for my collector conversation. Believe me, the pleasure was all mine. The response has been nothing short of amazing, and it is mutual. Okay, now, speaking of motorsports, here's a name often associated with flight and space flight. Omega Speedmaster, but we're talking about the Mark II racing dial. It was born in 1969 on the 145-014 reference. It was reborn in 2014 on a watch that is materially different, but aesthetically similar. So let's start with the basics. Its racing moniker derives from the historic dial's appearance, which includes a combination of red, orange, and a staggered seconds and minutes track that looks rather like the checkered flag that waves at the end of a motor race. In other words, this one was not for flying, it was for driving, and for racers at that. At 42.4 millimeters in steel, it's a bit chunky in its tonneau case, but so was the 70s original, so it fits the rhyme scheme. The new Mark II racing carries upgrades like a sapphire crystal, automatic winding, Luminova, a chronometer certification, a column wheel chrono, an anti-magnetic silicon hairspring, and of course the coaxial escapement. What really sets this one apart though is the combination of automatic winding and the 100 meter water resistance. Two features the original didn't have even when it was new, making this a much more usable day-to-day -day watch. The movement is a rather rare column wheel coaxial adaptation of a Valju 7750. So super cool if you're into mutations, because I believe this is a movement that once upon a time started as the Venus 188. It became the Valju 7733 when Valju bought Venus. It then became the 7750 when they attached a modular automatic system to it. And now with column wheel and coaxial, it is the Omega 3330. I don't think its own designer back at Venus would have recognized it. I would also say this watch is not common, and relatively few are available for sale, but prices are very approachable by 2023 watch standards. Budget five grand for one of these used and just enjoy. That's the great thing about a modern watch. You don't have to baby it the way you would with a true vintage. Okay, we've got external joining in from Munich and Central Europe. Welcome, thank you for staying up late with us. We've got Mark O saying, I love the Platinum Daytona, but don't know how you wear this out without attracting the wrong kind of attention. It's gonna be very geographically proximate. Know your town, know your turf. There are some places in the US and Europe where it's not a problem. There's some places where you wouldn't wanna go out with any kind of expensive watch. Know where you go. That's my rule of thumb. Mark S joining in. Tim, how would you rate the finishing of the Rolex movement? Better than AP Royal Oak, etc. I'd say these days it's about on par with your typical AP automatic. So take an AP Caliber 4401 automatic chrono. It's about on par with this new display case back Rolex. But I would say Vacheron, Longa, and Patek are still on a different level finish-wise. AP still makes a couple of ultra haute de gamme watches that truly are hand-finished. But most of what they make these days, machine-finished. 
even if they are machine hand fusion, the result is no better than what Rolex is achieving assuredly with complete automation. What else is going on in the chat box? You know it always moves fast. Andrew T saying, love the Mark II, such a refreshment in the world of endless professionals and Speedmaster limited editions. Definitely. We got Fabian Cruz joining in from Atlanta and Aunt G. Hey Tim, thoughts on the JLC Sector Chronograph Future Classic? Probably, but a cult watch. Don't expect this one to be mainstream ever. I don't think anyone's ever going to pay a lot of money. There's a difference between a classic, a collectible, and an investment. You can be classic and collectible without being an investment. And I think we're going to have classic and collectible sector dial JLCs. If you want an investment, think sector dial Patek Philippe. All right, jumping back into our regularly scheduled program. Here's one we don't often talk about from a brand rarely mentioned. Gerard Perigo, a little bit off the beaten path. This was Luigi Macaluso's motorsports chronograph. He was a championship winning rally driver. He became the Italian distributor of Gerard Perigo in the 80s. In the early 90s, he bought the company. So soliciting driver's feedback in the early 2000s, he created the R&D 01 chronograph. This is the 250 piece version of it, the Monte Carlo 1983. And you can see all of the basic features here. It's 43 millimeters in steel. It's an inverted chronograph for easier operation while wearing gloves and while the watch is on the wrist. We've got an internal rotating timing bezel, so think dive watch. And then we have a 24 hour subdial that tracks the time at center, giving you AM, PM distinction. Uh, keep in mind, this is there for you 24-hour endurance racers, a la Spa, Le Mans, and Nürburgring. And then we also have a central register minutes display, like an old Le Mans chronograph, which is really handy, because it can be tough to read sub-registers in the heat of battle. Now, this watch has a Gerard Perigo 3300 manufacturer automatic base, so yes, it is high horology through and through. The R&D01 is a rare product from an autologerie manufacturer, primed for a revival under new ownership, as in the past year, GP, along with UN, purchased back from carrying by their management. And from what I understand, these are people who are committed to the brands, and the brands are in good hands. But it's great to look at the back catalog, because I'd rather get on board with a brand that perhaps is leaving the station, taking off and reviving, than one that might be flagging and losing steam. You can still get these things, Autologerie, for 5,000 bucks. This is not like an Omega, this is not like a Rolex. These are handmade, these are rare, and definitely worth your five grand. Viewer is shots number two. I asked, you answered your analog on my digital. We're gonna start with Jeb B in Alice Springs, Australia, with his Rolex GMT Lefty. By the way, Alice Springs has one of those rare 30-minute GMT offsets, so he's a bit betwixt and between with this watch. Simply can't find satisfaction. That's okay, because that might be our best pure photograph of the wrist shots tonight. You're a winner, Jeb. Dr. S and his Rolex Daytona Roll in a school bus yellow Boss Mustang. That's the Boss 302 Mustang for you out of the country, a high-performance version of an American pony car. Jimmy Wise reading about and wearing Rolex with his Sky Dweller annual calendar GMT and Selling the Crown. If you want to hear my interview with the author of Selling the Crown, Brendan Cunningham, check out my podcast series. Max S up next captures his seafaring submariner against a nautical background in Seaside Beach, Florida. Mike W. Sets his Grand Seiko SBGA 413 against its namesake, the Cherry Blossom Tree I Do Love Spring. Send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com. All right, jumping back into the box, Nicholas E saying it's a bit after 9 a.m. in Auckland. Tim obviously enjoys gentlemen's hours. We've got Watch on the side joining us from the American West in Arizona. Miroslav R from Europe saying the Speedy is so evergreen. And Mr. Ninja saying he finally caught a live one. Thank you for joining, JN. And let's see what you guys are saying now, because this chat box moves fast. We've got Abdul joining us from the Black Forest in Germany, and Masters of Time, who opines, no doubt a popular notion, the Rolex has become so boring. We'll do some Rolex vintage sometime and show you things you've never seen. But let's start with some things that you've seen because we're talking pilot's chronographs here and I just have to mention this one. I'm sorry guys, but I gotta do it. The Omega Speedmaster Professional Moon Watch, new for 2021, now a master chronometer because of course, 
It's not the most feature-packed or legible chrono, but it's actually flown, so it's got a legitimacy that no pilot-style chronograph will ever have. Still NASA certified for space, and how much do you love that they put all the advertising on the back? Way too much information, not just about moon flight and certification, coaxial, master chronometer. I get it, guys. Thank you for putting that on the back of the watch where I don't have to see it full time. It still looks great, even in casual trim. You can dress it up or dress it down, leather, NATO straps, it always looks good. It's a very versatile watch, you can style it your way. 42 millimeters in stainless steel, still with the NASA specified thermoplastic crystal, because it's hard to shatter, and again, Fragments in zero gravity, you can't have that in space, hence no sapphire crystals on the moon watch. Though you can get this model with a sapphire crystal front and back. The new moon watch is still La Magna based, but very distantly. This one has a whole lot less in common with the old La Magna 1873 a Bausch than before. Doing business as the 3861, it's a next generation caliber, free sprung, coaxial, master chronometer, anti-magnetic. And with a little bit of extra power reserve at 50, it is highly upgraded, though it still has that lush and lovely La Magna Bausch history. But at $6,600, prices on the basic full bracelet moon watch are creeping up. And we're now over $7,500 if you want to get the sapphire sandwich on a bracelet. A little bit much for something built this massively. But I will say, if you want authenticity, this delivers it and then some. Older caliber 1861s and display case backs with 863 or 1863 would be my choice personally. But if you want the latest moon watch and you want it new in box with full warranty, this is it. Right here we have a comment from Abdul saying, I never had the need to get the Speedy. I like the Breguet Type 20 more. And in 39 millimeters, whether it's the Era Naval or the Transatlantique, you cannot go wrong. Try to find one of the blue dials or salmon dials. If you really want a scavenger hunt, try to find the 2003 Salmon Dial Limited Edition. It will be worth your while. It's white gold, it's expensive, but it's worth your while. We got Curtis A saying, back in the early 1960s, American Airlines would award a LeCoult chronograph to retiring pilots engraved on the back with the pilot's name, flight hours, and in Latin, time flies. Celine Driver, a man after my own heart, I love watches and wheels, saying, I think if Tim said anything about Zelos, he'd burst into flames. Well, I guess I just did, so we disproved the theory. I love all watches, guys. I have no dogmas. We have Amit K. Tim, what's your favorite non-Rolex Omega Patek Chrono? Mine is the Tortu Mono Pusher. I'd say I would have to choose either something from Mont Blanc Minerva, which will show up later, or the original MIH watch. That off the cuff, that's what comes to mind. But I do love me some 5170P from Patek Philippe. Lots of great choices there. Okay. Zin. I love them, you love them, but something different today. The EZM 10 test off from the Mission Timer series. Without going quartz multifunction, this is the ultimate pilot's chronograph, and I do mean that. Literally every Zin proprietary technology in one watch. Let's run the list. Tegmented titanium, meaning yes, it's titanium, but it's 1200 Vickers. You can savage it with a key or a razor and not leave a mark. We have a nitrogen fill to push out impurities from the case with a copper sulfate insert to pull any moisture out of the case should it intrude. We have the SZ01, which is Zinn's own proprietary modification of 7750. What does it give us? Well, in addition to German watchmaking street cred, it gives us a Lemania-like center minutes and seconds coaxial. We've got a sapphire capped bezel. You can see it right there, lush and lovely like a 50 fathoms. We've got Diapol, which is a diamond coated escapement that does entirely away with any kind of lubrication. We have 80,000 ampere per meter anti-magnetism for protection against electromagnetic flux, that is Mille Gauss. We have lubricants formulated for negative 45 degrees plus 80 degrees Celsius. What is that in Imperial Fahrenheit? Well, it's minus 49,176. You'll be dead, but your watch will not be. And we have Testoff pilot's watch certification. This is something that Zinn and the University of Aachen co-developed, and it's an open standard, so anyone can test off certify a pilot's watch, and in fact, others have, so it's a legit certification. It's not the fox guarding the hen house, so to speak, by Zinn. This watch has that, and that's important, because the model came out in 2011, but it didn't 
didn't become test off until 2015. Make sure you get the test off model. Now, in addition to proprietary technology, there's a lot of capability that's not exclusive but still very desirable, including blazing loom, both on the dial and the bezel. Note the chronograph fully loomed as well. 60 minute rotating timing bezel, great for timing missions. We have a 200 meter water resistance, which is hugely non-standard for pilot's watches. They're usually not swimmable. And a bracelet in matching tegmented tie. Hard to find, but worth your while and worth the premium. Here's the catch, and there is a big catch, because it's a big watch. That's on my wrist, 16 centimeters. Guys, this is 46 and a half millimeters, comically oversized, but it's big for the sake of legibility. So there is a functionality to its size. It's not just too beefy for the sake of guys who have something to prove, unless they need to prove that they're pilots, because this thing is the real deal. Discontinued, but expect to pay 6,000 to 7,500, depending on the age, whether it's test off, full box papers, and bracelet. For 75 grand, you get this thing full box papers, test off, and the bracelet, you are operating. It is the most sophisticated mechanical pilot's watch ever made. Okay, now we go to the dark side, quartz, guys. I warned you this was coming, but I love this watch, and I hope you love it as well. Breitling Aerospace Evo, launched in 2013, the latest model in a long-running line that dates back to 1985. So far enjoying a stay of execution in Breitling's vocation-oriented professional collection these days. So why did I include this and not the theoretically more feature-dense Omega X33? Well, frankly, the Breitling is just a lot easier to use and more intuitive. The X33 and the Z33 are unbearably dense in their current iterations. With this 43 millimeter titanium Breitling, you get a hell of a lot available on bracelet or strap. Let's count everything you get. You get a perpetual calendar, a chronograph, a countdown timer with alarm, a time of day alarm, dual time capability, an electronic minute repeater that chimes the time and you can dance to it, analog and digital displays, we get a backlight that is also NVG compatible for you with night vision goggles out there. This is a professional watch after all. It is thermocompensated super quartz. So whereas the standard quartz is 15 seconds a month, this is 15 seconds per year, and it's a COSC chronometer. It's one of the very, very few COSC certified quartz watches in existence. Plus, three to four years of battery life, and it will let you know it's dying with an end of life indicator. Additional features are rare for the pilot's genre, 100 meter swimmable water resistance, a unidirectional dive style bezel, which means you could probably use this one as a diver with the constant seconds running and backlit, and we get conventional Luminova on top of the backlight as a backup, and several different versions with straps and bracelets and different colored dials so you can style with your dial. $4,450 retail to buy new, but you can find them used for a whole lot less than that as ever. With a watch that's got five years of warranty, I would say just buy pre-owned, get it under warranty, and get yourself a discount. All right, guys, jumping back into the box, we've got Gel Mibson. I see what you did there. Saying, I only use my Zinn Mission Timer to see Joe Fast or how fast my AD can bring out the Daytona I ordered. You're gonna be waiting a while. And then we've got Celine Driver saying, I have an aerospace, love it, and I have its big brother, the first generation emergency. We have Hans N who's got a bug out, but thank you for joining me, Hans. Guys, let's keep this concurrent view count up there. Let's try to get this over 300. Viewer is shots. Shaked O of Oregon heads out for a Pacific Northwest drive, which is why it appears to be raining, with his Tudor Black Bay 54 behind the wheel. Roy S. gives us a different kind of watches and wheels with his Breitling B09 and Gas Gas 250 TXT dirt bike. We've got Andy Z celebrates the virtues of his versatile Cartier Santos Large in steel. We've got James W. who forwards a shot of Finn the dog wearing a Rolex Explorer 2 Polar. You know we love our watches and whiskers, so keep those coming. We like cats as well, and if you've got small pets, chinchilla, guinea pigs, hamsters, send those too. Tony G heads out for an elegant dinner, properly equipped with Balm et Mercier. I love that bracelet. Send your wrist chats to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com. Okay, top 10 chronographs to buy in 2023. Here are the heavy hitters. 
haute horlogerie. We get to my favorite type of chronographs. All of these are really expensive, but you get what you pay for. Starting with H, Moser, and C, and the Streamliner Flyback Chronograph. So this launched back in 2020. It was both the first of the new Streamliner Integrated Bracelet Sports Watch Collection, and the first Moser chronograph of any kind. So it's 42.3 millimeters in steel. It's a clear homage to the 70s, but what I love is that you can see the references without this being derivative of any given model. It's not a Royal Oak or a Nautilus with enough details changed to avoid getting sued. You see a bit of Omega Speed Sonic chronograph lobster bracelet. You see a little bit of Oris Chronoris star. Maybe you see a little bit of a tonneau case Hoyer. Maybe you see a bit of an Ebel Sport Classic, but it's not any one of those. In fact, I spoke to Edward Melan of Moser, he's the CEO today. He told me that Icapod was actually one of the inspirations, and that's a 90s watch. The chronograph has a fluid, almost organic profile, like some sort of annelid or maybe a sea creature with a segmented shell. It's a lovely looking thing, unlike any others in this crowded segment. The racing dial, we saw this earlier in the show, it's making a comeback in the modern era with the checkered flag seconds track. We've got some ceramic blocks of globalite loom on the hands, which by the way are black polished. We've got a smoked gray fume fade, and this was the original 100 piece limited edition model. Uh, it was an expensive and expressive dial that was redolent of Moser design. Everything they are reflected in one watch face. Now initially that was the 100 piece. Later there was a blue dial model that became a piece of the regular collection, limited by production but not by edition. And then also the Aschengraf. This was one of the first times Moser went outside to bring in a movement, and they did it with a partner in which they have now invested as an equity stakeholder, and of course that is Agenor of Geneva. Now you'll find this movement in Fabergé, you'll find it in Singer, but most notably you'll find it in the Moser Streamliner, and it gives us a lot. Although it doesn't look it, it's an automatic chronograph with a hidden rotor under the dial of the watch. You've got a flyback chronograph operation, a center-mounted coaxial chronograph hand, along with minutes and seconds stacked atop, again, like an old Lemagna. Now there's 120 meter water resistance, but what sets this apart is that Moser explicitly vows you can use the chronograph underwater down to the rated depth. And take a look at the center wheel of the chronograph on that bridge right in the middle of the movement. Look at those devil's horns where two beveled edges meet times two. That is super special. Jean-Marc Wiederest of Agenor has said this movement meets the standards for the Poisson de Genève, he just doesn't bother to certify it. And you can see that in the finish right there. Very special column wheel. Agen clutch, which reduces play, very, very upscale. And at $44,600, it's not cheap. But then we are talking about a high luxury option. Okay, Patek Philippe 5172G. Launched in 2019, it was the successor to the 5170. And compare this to the 2010 initial launch edition of the 5170. We don't want this today. No one wants a silver dial, Roman numerals, stick indices, and yellow gold. That's how Patek and Rolex used to launch the initial version of a new watch, as conservative as possible. But with the 5172, Patek cut to the chase and gave us what we wanted. We got a white metal case, a dark colored dial, Arabic numerals, and loom right from the first. No suffering through years of yellow gold, silver dials, and stick indices. Patek waited until 2015, remind, Remember, to give us a 5170 that looks like this. They learned their lesson. Give the people what they want right out of the gate. And the 5172 is that. Coming in at 41 millimeters in white gold, you now have two very charismatic options, as there is a new salmon dial available for those who perhaps want a lighter option and a little bit of lush, warm rose tone. Now, vintage references include the 2405 reference for the lugs and the 1463 chronograph a tasty tondi round buttons with the turbine cap profile for the chronograph pushers. You can see them there right on the edge. The caliber 29535 frontally assaults the longer reputation for finishing superiority on fine movements and chronographs with equal measures of beautiful architecture and detail finishing. This is as good as any Dottograph or 1815. We also have lovely and charming syringe style hands in blackened white gold with Arabic numerals to match and a surprising amount of loom for a dress watch. And for $82,800 it should look and loom fantastic. 
Let's jump into the box with Amit K saying, is a 100 piece limited edition from Moser for a brand that only makes 1500 watches a year really that limited? Well, Moser's now at about three to 4,000 a year, so yes, that is very limited. And also keep in mind that Rolex now makes a million watches a year, and there will be thousands of those limited platinum Daytonas. So you gotta keep everything in perspective. 100 pieces is very, very scarce, and they're few and far between. Rarely do we have more than, I'd say between one and zero of them in stock here at Watchbox, and all we do is high-end pre-owned. What else is going on? Jean-Claude Biver is saying that 5170P is grail, and I gotta agree with you. We talked about the poetry of diamond indices on a men's watch. Mm. Patek much? You better believe with the 5170P. Okay, here's the watch that satisfies our need for a diving chronograph in tonight's show. And it's auto logerie, so it fits into this segment. Blanc Pen 50 Fathoms Bathyscaph Chronograph Flyback. Sean, can we go full screen with this one? A very, very cool watch. This variant came out in 2020. The original Bathyscaph Flyback Chrono came out in 2014. This is the one I'd get. Fume Fade Green Dial with Ceramic Bezel Cap to match. It's 43.6 millimeters, but the whole case is ceramic, which means you get that lovely scratch resistance, lightness, and hypoallergenic quality of ceramic. It is my kind of daily driver. So green dial, new for 2020, and in my opinion, this is the perfect version. Let's go one of the blue dial ocean commitment variants. Diving specs are robust, 300 meter water resistance, 120 click bezel, super slick. The bezel action is outstanding, but it pales in comparison to the chronograph movement, which makes this watch. The F385 movement is packed with fine finish that looks like it belongs on a watch costing multiples as much as this Blanc Pen's $17,900. Those bevels, let's get close guys, those are scary good. Those actually remind me of the likes of Laurent Ferrier and Romain Gautier, and while I know they can't possibly finish, be finished the same way, look how they stacked bevels. This is as good as hand finishing on a watch that's undoubtedly made in series, but with love and painstaking attention to detail. Look at the jewel and the screw countersinks. Those two are beveled. And look at the satination with snailing across the bridges. Oh, I'm getting hot flashes, guys. So, spec here, tech, for the movement. Not just the way it looks, but the way it cooks. 50 hour power reserve, column wheel chronograph, super crisp operation, vertical clutch, super smooth. We have flyback action on the chrono, 36,000 vibration per hour, El Primero style, 10 beats per second, high beat rate. We have a full balance bridge that is free sprung, and get this guys, adjusted in six positions, not the mere chronometer standard of five. So going above and beyond anti-magnetic with a silicon hairspring, and it reads like the spec sheet of a hypothetical third generation Zenith El Primero that doesn't exist yet. In other words, impressive. And while it might look bridge-wise like it's based on the old FP1185, it's a much more durable, sports-oriented, modern movement. The F385 is definitely not an 1185 mod. Remember, the flyback 1185 is the F185, which means this new movement is both more bashable for a sports watch and it has hacking. This green Blanc pen is my first choice among all diving chronographs. All right, jumping into the box, we got Caliber YQG and Abdul both saying the Dotograph is the one for them, and I don't disagree. That's a great choice, but I prefer the 39 millimeter original Dotto. We have Mark O. Tim, do you think the bottle green dials will stand the test of time? Some will, some won't. I think stuff like, for example, the Breitling Pistachio will age really nicely. I think the old Panerai Bronzo, a PAM382, will age beautifully because it predated the green dial trend and it doesn't derive from it. Some, as with all design trends, will endure and be evergreen, pun intended, but some will also look profoundly dated. And I think some of those Kelly greens are going to be the ones that date the worst. All right, you know what we never discuss on this show? Mont Blanc, and we really should, and it fits in this segment. It must be said that the 2022 Mont Blanc 1858 Minerva Mono Pusher Chronograph Red Arrow lives up to its ridiculously long name. The 42 millimeter steel chrono was an 88 piece limited edition, still cataloged and available now, so still current. We should remind everyone that Mont Blanc which started with pens, leather goods, and accessories, is now very much a watchmaker, and it has been since 1997, but it has two factories. La Loque, which is mass production up to 100,000 units a year, and Villaray, which is maybe three to 400 units a year. We're talking about the latter. 
Villaray is Minerva, which used to be a very low volume haute de gamme independent. And this has it all. Look at that caliber. Everything, inward angles, outward angles. We have German silver bridges and plates hand finished, but also steel chronograph components. Look at that devil's tail arrow on the chronograph clutch. Look at the solarization on the ratchet wheel. And by the way, that devil's tail with inward and outward angles on a part so small they could be forgiven for not finishing at all. My God, this thing is surpassing. It's got enough to make Patek, Lange, even Laurent Ferrier and Romain Gautier not just impressed, but jealous. The caliber 1321 is as traditional as chronographs get, which means manual wind, lateral clutch, column wheel, 60 hour power reserve, overcoil hairspring, an enormous balance, almost the radius of the movement, beaten away at a stately 18K. This is Nirvana, or maybe I should say it's Minerva. guys. Minerva movement Mont Blancs need to be thought of as a separate class of watch comparable to the best independents, Langa and of course the Holy Trinity. We need to class them that way. Break the Villaray out from the Laloque, you get something that is world class that can beat the best. Dial detail too is first rate right here and it comprises a surprising amount of loom with that little red arrow you see at the top which is actually an internal mobile index that's connected to a rotating white gold bezel on a steel case. So it's actually a very subtle two-tone as well. Internal rotating bezel, note the use of both a tachometer and telemeter scale for vintage enthusiasts. We got a baton hour and a syringe minute and it doesn't get much better than this. In fact, the $30,500 price seems downright reasonable for the quality and you could easily daily this monster. Okay, viewers chats number four, Greg P of Baltimore shares a 19 53 Hamilton Rodney in Oaxaca Duarez, Mexico. Looking very cool, guys. We've got Eric R. sharing his reborn Illinois-based Vortex Springfield 197 Lapine, also known as Bullhead, wristwatch. We've got John W. who rolls with his Honda CRV and his two-tone Rolex Explorer 36, a future classic. John S. is behind the wheel of his vintage Mercedes-Benz SL450 with his AP Jules Audemars chronograph, which is what an AP dress watch should be. And Sean A. from Colorado takes us home with Fonzie the Bulldog and Rolex with watches tonight. Whiskers and watches and recursive watches tonight. Guys, send your wrist shots to Monday Mail at thewatchbox.com to see your pieces in this picture. Guys, join me on Instagram, Tim underscore Masso, and check out the new Watchbox app. Time out, Tim out, thanks to Sean on the switcher and our live studio audience. I will see you guys down the line.